The other thing is advertising SPF in countries where the products have not been tested against local regulations. And you might be going, okay, well, what does that mean? This has been an issue for Korean beauty brands in a lot of countries, predominantly in the US and Australia, where sunscreen is regulated as a drug and or a therapeutic good. So in the American case, sunscreens are regulated as drugs. In Australia, we basically consider them to be drugs or medicines, but the terminology that we use for it is therapeutic good, and that is regulated um, by a body called the, uh, the TGA, the Therapeutic Goods Administration. So I remember, for example, when the Korean sunscreen scandal broke out that there was one case of the the Australian Instagram account of one extremely popular K-beauty brand. They admitted that even though they were number one selling the product against Australian regulations, they knew it wasn't registered for sale in Australia, but they were selling it anyway. Number two, they knew that it wasn't an SPF 50 according to Australian standards, but they were distributing it anyway. Now, there are multiple violations mixed up in that, but that blew my mind when I heard that because not only were they admitting that they knew they shouldn't be distributing the product, they admitted that even though their product was labeled as an SPF 50 product, they knew it didn't meet SPF 50 regulatory standards in Australia and they just didn't care. They just kept selling it. Uh, They were distributing it through multiple different distributors as well. Uh, And they actually said in their Instagram post, which I took a screen capture of because my mind was so blown, that it was more likely to be, I'm pretty sure, like an SPF 30. I'm like, that is a problem. That is a major problem. If you are putting to market in a market where the product is non-compliant, that your product is labeled SPF 50, that means something according to Australian law. And you can't just say, oh yeah, but it's SPF 50 in Korea. So like, who cares? You just can't do that. And that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about here is that the brands already know that their product is non-compliant, but they are selling it anyway. Now there are some Korean beauty brands that have been pulled up by Amazon for doing that. And they've actually had the products removed from Amazon because Amazon knows that the products aren't compliant because they don't meet the uh, US standards. So they've taken the products off the Amazon platform so that they're no longer allowed to be sold there. But I think brands that do this are clearly demonstrating to consumers and regulators that they value profits over the safety of their own consumers. And that makes it not only dodgy, it's unethical and also anti-competitive. I know in a lot of the uh, different countries, the process for actually bringing a sunscreen product to market is so lengthy. It's so costly, not just the registration fees, but the, the proving everything that you need to prove to be able to actually label your product in that way. That's the dodgy part about it is that they haven't done that and other brands in the market have done that, yet they still think that it's okay to just keep doing it. And when the sunscreen scandal broke, there was another brand that Uh, was quite big that had actually tried to get around that requirement by naming the product something different in the US example than the Korean example, but doing a wink, wink, nudge, nudge to all their consumers and going, well, you know, it's an SPF 50 in Korea. So just buy this product, wink, wink, nudge, nudge in America, even though it's non-compliant. And that is just not a good way to run a business for so many different reasons. And in the end, that actually did come back and bite them in the bum because that was one of the products that ended up being caught up in the sunscreen scandal and it actually tested below SPF 50 anyway. But I just think the pro, the um, the amount of brands that do this that are happy to distribute to companies, uh, you know, in countries where they know they're not compliant, like it's a problem. I have, you know, and not sharing any names, but in the past spoken to brands on the Korean side and I know that they just don't care because they would rather make the sale. So they've just kind of said to to us, like, oh, no, Style Story can, you know, deal with that on the Australian side. And I'm like, yeah, but there is no way for us to deal with it. The only way that we can do it is by doing it illegally. So, like, that's not an option for us. Uh, And they're kind of like, oh, well, wash their hands of the problem. So that is an issue in the Korean beauty industry. And I think the thing that makes it super complicated is because a lot of consumers will tell you, oh yeah, but I already know that the product is an SPF 50 in Korea is not the same as an SPF product 
uh, an SPF 50 product in Australia, but not everyone does know that. So people that are like buying their products from overseas and whatnot, you know, there's nothing anyone can do about that. And the regulators a lot of the time are not concerned about that. Although anecdotally, I have heard that the Canadian um, quarantine officials do sometimes stop packages that contain sunscreens, Korean sunscreens, if they can see them crossing the border because they know that they're non-compliant. So they are obviously quite on the front foot about stopping that kind of thing. But in the Australian example, there is actually no law that stops a consumer from purchasing the product from a store overseas and bringing it back. As long as they're not distributing it for sale, the uh, regulations are quite specific about the product cannot be marketed as a sunscreen if it hasn't been registered in Australia. So if you were just an ordinary person buying a Korean sunscreen online from store overseas and then using it for yourself that there's actually nothing that the Australian uh, authorities will do about that they'll just go that's fine that's you we understand you know that you know what you've bought and that's fine the problem creeps in when those people you know try and then distribute the product and then that's where the regulatory violation comes in but a lot of people don't realize that SPF 50 means something different in different countries and that, you know, phrases that are commonly used in their country like broad spectrum protection and things like that either don't exist or have a different meaning overseas. And one person that I can think of is my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law is very, very careful about her sun protection. She has always used sunscreen since she was a little girl. She, every time she drives in Australia, she wears driving gloves because she takes her UV protection really seriously. And one time I was over at her place and she had a Japanese sunscreen and she said, oh, have you put sunscreen on yet? Uh, and I said to her, I have put sunscreen on, but I wouldn't use that one here because it's not SPF 50 by the Australian standards. Like it's not allowed to be sold here. And she, that blew her mind. She was like, what do you mean? And I said, well, SPF 50 and the way that the tests are carried out, particularly for things like uh, waterproofing and things like that are very different in Japan than they are in Australia. And there's a different process that brands have to go to through to actually get their product onto market in Japan versus Australia. And she had no idea. She thought that SPF 50 meant the same thing in every country. And the thing is, I think a lot of people People do think that. So I feel like brands that are taking advantage of that in circumstances where they know that they don't have the right, um, you know, certifications and things like that in place is an issue. And I think that, you know, some of them are probably just a bit sloppy and they didn't realize. And then some people are doing the wrong thing. They know about it and they just don't care. But I think that falls under the umbrella of what I would like to call dodgy marketing tactics. So I just thought I would cover a few of these. It's not too, I don't want to diss our industry. I think there are so many good things about the Korean beauty industry and so many brands that are doing amazing things. But there are some you know, as would be the case in any industry, players that bring a bad name to the industry by doing the wrong thing. And that really saddens me to see because anything that rogue brands do that brings like mistrust to the industry in the end harms everybody. So I think just knowing what some of the issues are potentially are so that you can look out for it if you're seeing you know this kind of marketing if you're wondering you know that that's a question I get asked a lot I don't know why the sunscreen thing seems to be the thing that everyone's like oh I think it's because not too many people talk about it because they would rather just make the money from selling the sunscreens and people always say to me but I'm shocked I've seen that product for sale in a store or I've seen that product for sale on Amazon or somewhere you know that it shouldn't be for sale how does that happen why does that happen and you know the truth is it's fairly easy if you think about it for people to just get a whole lot of products you could put them in a suitcase bring them back to your country and just start selling them online like the authorities are not going to catch everyone doing it they probably have bigger fish to fry uh, and you know there's probably a scale in their eyes of things that are more high priority you know if you think about what the particular regulators are actually in charge of you know there's there, there's everything from people that are performing illegal plastic surgery surgeries or using, you know, something that they've spun up in their kitchen to fill people's lips versus people that are bootlegging Korean sunscreens. It's probably lower down on their list of priorities, but it doesn't make it any less of an issue in terms of people being non-compliant. So 
Look, I, I don't want to put too fine of a point on it. I think there are a lot of brands that are doing the right thing, a lot of brands that are really, really ethical and are thinking these things through and have like a stance on where they draw the line with things. But for the brands that don't care so much about that, it's a pity. Uh, and, you know, I hope to see less of it in the future. Um, you know, obviously there are some communities that are taking matters into their own hands, like the subreddit that, that I mentioned that has basically just gone, right, if you're going to engage in those type of practices, we're just going to ban you and we're going to ban people from talking about your brand full stop. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to go through some of them. Uh, you'll have to let me know. Have you seen any of these kind of things in action? Are there any that I missed that you have gone, hmm, that's a little bit dodgy, uh, you know, let me know. I would definitely like to know if uh, you've seen any of these, if you've, you know, heard of any others. I'm sure I've missed some stuff, but I did just want to cover some of the ones that I've seen, have that chat with you guys. And yeah, I'm going to finish it up here. I will be back in your ears again. Uh, until next time, I will see you on Style Story.